Hello and uh, welcome to Reframe Cancer's latest webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, today we are looking at uh, a very important topic, how to support employees working through cancer. Um, important topic for individuals who might want to work through cancer and not able to work through cancer, how the organisation can help them uh, go through that particular journey in the best way possible. Um, with me today, just are two people, two experts. This one is uh, Rebecca or Bex Minton, um, cancer nurse specialist here at uh, Reframe Cancer, um, and also Kate Higgins, HR consultant uh, who's worked for in a range of different industries. Um, Bex, could you just give a quick overview of you, your background, and uh, the work you do here at Reframe? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, my name is Rebecca, or um, otherwise known as Bex. Um, I qualified uh, as a registered nurse um, over 14 years ago now um, and quickly found that actually cancer care was uh, where I sort of had my passion. Um, I've worked on chemotherapy wards um, and I've managed a, a chemotherapy daycare unit um, and I've since been at Reframe for six years um, caring for cancer patients uh, with all different uh, cancer diagnosis. Um, thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, and yeah, it's just very rewarding to to help and support patients when they need it the most. Thanks, Bex. Um, glad, glad to have you here. Thanks for taking part in this. Uh, Kate, um, welcome. Welcome. The second one for you. Thank you for joining us and yep. joining us from France. We appreciate the time you're giving up Indeed. for us whilst on holiday. You're very welcome. Uh, if you just give yeah, us a Thank you for having me. Um, nice to meet everybody. My name is Kate Higgins. i um, worked in HR for about 25 years. Um, in various different industries, financial services, pharmaceuticals, telecoms. And throughout my career, I have partnered with a number of leaders and employees who have experienced either cancer from a personal perspective or as a member of their team. And my job is to support the manager, the employee, the, the organisation to the best of my ability. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Bo. Thanks for being part of this today. So the kind of areas that we're going to be focusing on today uh, and learning more about it is um, how cancer affects people at different stages of the cancer pathway, their personalised um, journey. Um, is working with cancer possible? Is that something that um, can be done in, in an effective way for both the organisation and the individual? Um, how we might support that individual by making the right adjustments, making uh, their life at work easier for them given the, their personal circumstances uh, and equally how we might individualise that approach um, to make it easy for both both parties. Um, but if we just start off with why we're here, this is an important um, uh, part of the presentation because really trying to highlight the challenges that working age um, people may have um, because there's a number of, of statistics, some old, some new, um, which really identifies some challenges that organisations may be facing. Um, one is that, um, according to Working with Cancer, 900,000 people uh, of working age are, are living with cancer. Uh, and that number is expected to rise quite considerably to 1.15 by 2030, just around the corner, four years or so, six years or so away. So that number is increasing. People are going to be working with cancer. Um, we also know that about 127,000 people a year are diagnosed with cancer. Um, though we estimate that number is a bit low, that the numbers are, are back in 2018. So the likelihood is that number will be much higher now. Um, but more critical for, the, for this type of webinar and really frames why this is important is that uh, what we're seeing is a higher instance of, of people with cancer in the 25 to 49 year old age group. Uh, and cancer research is saying that that's up by 24%. And in fact, one of the highest um, age bands in terms of cancer incidence. Um, and that's uh, over a period of 1995 to 2019. They're really showing an increase in, in cancer in that really critical working age um, range, 25, 49. So your organisations may be facing this. Um, if they're not now, they may be in the future. So we're hopeful today we can um, give you some ideas, give you some tips, give you some guidance, which might help you. Uh, support individuals. Um, so if we'll just move forward to the cancer pathway. Um, Bex, um, if I could hand over to you on this one. Um, the individual's cancer pathway is personalised, it's very unique to them. 
Um, but could you give us a flavor of how an individual might continue to work or be able to work within certain stages of this cancer pathway? It's a long, complicated journey for a lot of people. Could you highlight a few that just gives a, a sense of how people can continue working during these phases? Yeah, sure. So as you can see there, the, the cancer pathway, it, it's a long cancer pathway, really right from screening right through to kind of palliative care um, end of life. Um, and so initially, uh, people might go for screening, um, they may look at preventative um, measures, and then they may find a, a concern. So that might be something like a lump or, or bowel changes, um, something like that, which then leads to a GP visit um, and on to kind of diagnostic testing. I think it's really important for an employer to bear in mind that at the stage of diagnosis, um, an employee is going to feel, feel very overwhelmed um, and it's going to be kind of around managing those emotions um, of the employee at that time. Um, it's around having understanding uh, for the employer's, employee's situation um, and maybe at that point um, recognising that they might just need a bit of time out whilst they're being diagnosed with a potential cancer diagnosis. Um, and that there may need to be some adaptations to their roles just whilst they're going through that particularly turbulent time. Um, also as well, at the stage of diagnosis or at the point of diagnosis, sorry, um, a, an employee is probably not going to be able to perform their role to the best of their ability. Their concentration levels um, are, are not, not really going to be there, not going to be great. Um, so it's just really important to just regularly check in at that point on the employee um, and just make sure that they have the time um, to go through the diagnosis process as they need to. Following a cancer diagnosis um, obviously does come some form of treatment. So if that's obviously um, chemotherapy, um, it really is best at that point to get an early occupational health um, referral put in place for the employee. Um, just so that they're able to be assessed by occupational health um, and have that communication with them in terms of speaking to them around how they might feel with the side effects, the, the tiredness and all the other um, debilitating side effects that can come with, with treatment. Um, if obviously a patient or an employee had um, surgery, obviously that does come with kind of reduced mobility, extreme tiredness, um, and it kind of will be up to the employer then to kind of recognise that they they may need to kind of um, pace their activities at work um, and may not able be able to kind of maintain the level of function that they did before. Um, so employers might want to look at, um, you know, periods of rest. So if it's possible, reduce work hours or maybe working one day and then having a day off so that the, the patient and employee, especially if they are on treatment, you know, can rest. Um, and then it's also as well looking at the kind of self-management end, it's really important for the employer to recognise things like scanxiety um, and fear of reoccurrence as well, because it's quite often thought that once um, someone's out of treatment, that that's kind of it, and then they're able to return to work and, and all is well. But actually, if they're having regular follow-ups, regular check-ins, it's really important at that point for the employer to recognise that they may need a bit of time off may need a bit of downtime um, at that point as well. Um, and then just important really just to be as flexible as, as possible um, throughout the kind of cancer pathway um, and just provide regular check-ins, um, especially around kind of appointment times as well. Excellent, thanks, Beck. So it's a long and complicated um, cancer journey for some, shorter for others in terms of um, uh, the type of cancer might have but in each case very personalized very customized important to keep open dialogue and um and do the, do your best to support the individual at whatever stage they might be at because some may be benefiting from that working environment yeah and and for some it might be that they get a diagnosis and then they kind of go on a bit of a watch and wait program where actually no intervention is, is needed so they probably will be okay to, to come back to work maybe with a bit of additional emotional support but for others if they are going on chemotherapy radiotherapy surgery um that would be a very very different um outcome in terms of returning to work indeed brilliant thanks Bex. um okay so let's, let's consider working through cancer um is it possible there might be assumption that's that people with cancer don't work can't work um don't want to work what, what's your view on this Bex? 
Yeah, it is absolutely possible. Um, and for some um, employees returning to work, providing that the, the company can manage those reasonable adjustments, um, it actually provides them with uh, a sense of purpose, um, a bit of distraction away from constantly thinking about cancer and the treatment that they're going through. Um, it can also help with, you know, decreasing the feeling of, of isolation, loneliness, low mood. Um, and obviously with a cancer diagnosis and, and going through treatment um, can actually come an awful lot of changes and, and sometimes an employee just wants to return to work just to kind of feel normal um, and how they did before the, the, the life impact that, that is cancer. Kate, I know, you know from the HR perspective this could be challenging. Any thoughts in terms of um, working through cancer and, and the, the challenges and the opportunities that it presents? It, it's such um, a complex time for the employee and for the employer to try to do the right thing. Um, and the way I have tended to talk about it with my managers that I've worked with in the past is like a little triangle. You've got what the employee wants. So to everything I agree and, and understand what Bex was just saying, they want to come back for normality, for the distraction, for the social interaction. And most employers will fully understand that and want to support it. But then you've got what they're physically able to do. And I've worked with a number of employees in the past who are so desperate to come back to work because they want to feel normal and they want to get back to their old life. But perhaps their health is still trying to catch up. So it's about thinking about what the employee wants, what they're able to do. And then thirdly, my third point on the triangle is what the company can accommodate. So. I know we're going to talk about this a um, little bit more later on, but it's thinking about how can we align those things and accommodating those individual needs um, and the nature of the role that the person does and the size of the company they work in will all be very relevant factors as to how much the employer can accommodate in terms of those um, new needs, either in the short or the long term. The other thing I would say is just how long is this going to be for? How long do I need to get cover in? Or when are they back? Um, one of my roles as an HR partner um, in trying to support the employee and the employer is to explain, well, we don't know that yet. We're going to have to work with what we know right now and, and never put the employee under any pressure to be able to predict the future because nobody can do that. So patience and communication and being able to balance those three things, I would say, are the most important functions that we can offer as an employer to support somebody going through that journey. Excellent. Thanks, Kate. Um, OK, so if somebody wants to um, continue working and are able, um, what support does someone need, um, Bex, to continue working um, through their cancer, cancer journey? Yeah, there's, there are lots of, it, it varies really from, from person to person. Um, I think it's important to remember that whilst, you know, um, there are jobs that people can go back into, there are also jobs out there that people may not be physically or mentally well enough to return to. Um, things like flexible start times, finish times, um, amended hours, they all need to be taken into consideration really um, for those that do want to continue um, working through cancer. Um, I think it's really important to just listen to the employee, listen to their needs and find out what it is that they may need. Um, you know, ask them what it is that they may need to have in place um, to make them feel more comfortable um, to return to work. Um, so a couple of examples, um, you know, someone with peripheral neuropathy, which is, is kind of um, numbness in your extremities. If they have a role where they're typing and things like that, they may need additional software. They may need dictation devices. Um, things like that. If someone's coming back and they're on treatment or they're just particularly feeling very fatigued, um, an employer you know, could suggest maybe additional breaks, taking on some administrative, uh, administrative duties um, or maybe working from home if that's possible. Um, I think it's really important as well to remember that um, roles are, are very, very different for each organisation. So a couple of examples. So obviously, if you have a, a shop worker um, who is public facing, you know, they are potentially really at risk um, of infection, especially if they're on chemotherapy. 
So for those employees, it will be really important to make sure they're wearing a mask, make sure on the days that they're vulnerable to infection, they potentially are either working from home or in the back office, something like that. If you've got someone that works in a, a factory or has kind of a, a manual labor job, um, you know, think about, you know, are they safe to operate machinery with chemo brain or brain fog? You know, are they able to carry out duties of lifting heavy loads, et cetera, et cetera? Um, an office worker, you know, if they're suffering from hot flushes, are they able to be in an air conditioned office? Um, are they able to be near a toilet? Are they able to take regular breaks? Um, is there somewhere to potentially store um, a medication fridge if they need to, to be on regular medication that needs to be refrigerated? Um, and for those potentially that have um, you know, been through bowel surgery or prostate surgery um, and may be experiencing um, incontinence, you know, are, is, is the employer able to adapt their role so that they can perhaps work from home or work in a quieter area so that their, the embarrassment of perhaps the incontinence um, you know, doesn't affect them? Um, I think it's also um, really important and, and a lot of um, employees that I've spoke to who have, who have um, got cancer, you know, really like just to be asked what it is that they need for their return to work. They really appreciate the regular check ins um, and the, the, the open communication as well with their, their line manager um, or colleagues. Um, but I think it's just really important to ask them what it is that they need, um, make sure that any plan that's put in place is, is done with them. Um, and just make sure that they are comfortable to return to work um, before doing so um, and that occupational health have, have done a thorough and full assessment on them as well before they do return. That, thank you, Bex. Um, yeah, really useful tips there. Um, Kate, from a HR perspective, um, you know, it's, it's often a balancing act in the best interest of, of that individual and what can be accommodated. And um, Equally, there's the, the perhaps the, the drier topic of the Equalities Act and the obligations under that. Can you give us a, a HR perspective, yeah. a viewpoint on um, on this for us? Yes, of course. So, thinking first about what Bex was just saying, you know, those are all brilliant examples of relatively small and actually low cost adjustments an employer can make to try and make their colleagues' journey back to work a little bit easier, a little bit less stressful, more achievable, because actually, almost without exception, what the employee wants is to get back to work, the employer wants them back. So those small changes along the way might make the difference between that working or working So I encourage just small things and not immediately worry, oh gosh, this is going to be going to be expensive and, and sometimes it isn't it might just be being a bit open-minded and saying well if we get over there or if we gave them an offer, small things might make a difference um specifically on the equality act um replaced all anti-discrimination laws and the equality now covers under one banner and all can are included and it doesn't just cover who presently have cancer it covers people who have had cancer in the past which is a really important point to know what the equality act will point an employer toward are reasonable adjustments so just technically is an employer to remove or reduce advantage that's related to someone's disability so if that employee Offering a disadvantage way um, related to their action, it's the extent to which employers can try and minimise those disadvantages or ideally remove them altogether. And small changes such as, um, as Bex was mentioning, increased break times or um, spreading breaks amongst the day or having a day in the office or at work, day from home, lots of different things. Um, that are possible that should be um, considered by an employer. What's important to note is what's reasonable for one employer might not be achievable or reasonable for another. And generally speaking, please don't quote me because I am generalising, you know, a larger organisation should be better able to make adjustments that are reasonable than a smaller organisation. With a large organisation like a big city, for example, has got 50 staff who work on the checkouts, trying to adjust a shift time for one of 
possible or, or certainly to me whereas a very small employer maybe who only has two or three members that might be much difficult to accommodate so that is worth considering uh, so the adjustments need to be real. they need to be affordable they could consider changes to the working environment to the nature of the work that the person does is there a different way somebody can do something and one example i can remember talking about with a manager they were dealing with quite fast-paced financial transactions but some of the transactions were not fast-paced and they had a much longer turnaround time so we would try and channel transact to the work on a phased return so if they judge the morning as an example it wouldn't matter if they finished those transactions the next day because they weren't time bound so just really creative ways might make the difference to help um, that person have a more successful return to work um, the employer does not have to change the basic nature of the job. Um, so um, an example I read about on ACAS talked about an employee who worked in a call centre handling calls all day. If they were no longer well enough or in, in that short term well enough to handle calls, the employer is not expected to make up a new job for them. But again, if there were an open vacancy or an extra need elsewhere in a larger organisation, it would be reasonable for them to try and find an alternative. So creative thinking to try and do the right thing for a person who's struggling is um, always the first place to start. Excellent, uh, yeah, good, good advice. Um, it, it's it's a difficult balance, isn't it, to, to get the right kind of support in place um, uh, that is really customised for that individual's needs, um, but equally finding a way of allowing them back to work or, or supporting their return to work in a way that's effective. Um, but there are ways, there are ways, and uh, to use your words, creative thinking, there's um, and an open mind, there's, there's ways to allow individuals to continue the benefits of working within an organization, part of a social network and, and um, being part of um, something that they can contribute to. It's an important part of, uh, of supporting them through um, that cancer journey. Yeah, if I may, Sean, I was just going to um, give an example. So for those that kind of need to be um, cognitively consistent, you know, in their role, so, you know, a dentist, pilot, teacher, plus, you know, many, many more, but that are actually struggling, um, whether it's brain fog or fatigue or, or something like that, um, you know, there may be other areas within the business, especially if it's a large organisation, as you said, Kate, um, that they, you know, may be able to, to look at another role. So an example um, that I have is, um, you know, a pilot, for instance, obviously, until they pass their physical to be able to um, get back up in the air and, and fly, um, you know, perhaps they could do some sort of ground based work, maybe some training, maybe some um, administrative um, writing or whatever it might be, um, just to kind of get them back to work. And I, I'm sure a lot of organisations would be really, really grateful. Same with a, a teacher, perhaps they might not feel ready to go back into the, the school as such, um, with fear of pupils, um, you know, noticing their wig or body change or whatever it might be. But actually, you know, could they work from home, do some lesson planning um, or be based in an office, but not quite um, in the classroom teaching, you know, like they did before until they're completely ready. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, creative thinking, I think, is the point here, isn't it? To just find ways um, that supports that individual back into the workplace. Thank you. Let's just, um, let's just touch on individualising the approach. I think we've we've covered a, quite a lot of this already, but it's, Bex, it's really important to have a really customised, personalised, individualised approach for that individual. Yeah, absolutely. As I said before, you know, any plan or any any um, thing that needs to change in the workplace really does need to to involve the employee at that point and make sure they're happy with it. Um, I think communication and regular check ins um, is key, um, whether that's kind of every other day, whether that's weekly, whether that's monthly, um, whatever is deemed best for the employee um, and also for the employer as well. Um, I think open communication as well for the employee is really important, you know, making them feel that they can come for an informal chat if that's what they want, also to discuss uh, any issues at work or how they feel about returning to work. Um, I think it's really, really important um, as an employer um, to not talk about their own experiences when they are having that meeting with the employee, um, purely because a lot of 
cancer patients spend most of their day hearing about others who have had a diagnosis or joining support groups and it's it's constantly you know talking about cancer and treatment etc cetera, etc cetera. so sometimes when they return to work they kind of just want to have the conversation about returning to work and what that might look like for them um, so i think it's really important to ask them as well at that point you know how do they want the conversation to go do they want to be asked how they are how treatment's going or do they just kind of want to stick to to talking about the reasonable adjustments and, and the return to work um, and I think it's also really, really important to communicate with um, your line manager in terms of how you want the wider organisation and your colleagues to approach you as well. You know, do you want them to come up and ask you how you're doing or do you want a bit of a blanket email to go out to say so and so is returning to work, but actually can we not mention anything kind of cancer related? Um, yeah that's not not for everybody some people might want to be asked how they're doing um but it's really important that 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 communication is there um i think that's that's kind of everything really um i think yeah. it's kind of asking as well about their side effects making sure that they're managed making sure that they're not coming to work with with pain um with nausea um and, and just being really flexible around kind of attending appointments um and just listening to them is the most important thing Thanks, Bex. So, to Kate, some important important requirements for HR there to be properly prepared. What kind of advice yeah. would you give? Well, do you know, I was thinking as um, Bex was speaking just then, there are some parts of this support journey that HR can't do um, without help, and that is the medical bits. Um, so, it's incredibly important, I think, as Bex mentioned earlier, to make an occupational health referral at the at the right time because whilst as an HR professional my job is to build a strong relationship with the employee and the manager and ensure that I facilitate that relationship as best as I can I have to rely on the medical advice that comes from occupational health and what occupational health will do and should do is liaise with the employee liaise with their treating practitioners their team of specialists and they will translate medical information and advice and prognoses into language that's useful for me as an employer so they will say to me exactly what that person needs and my job is then to translate that into something that we can or can't in, in all cases but you know partly at least accommodate in the workplace so individually individualizing our approach is hugely dependent on the communications that you just mentioned Bex but also the medical input from occupational health and I feel like as a partner in in relationships like this my job has been to pull all those strands together and ensure that we've got all the information that we need that those conversations are facilitated and we can say say what we're afraid of uh, i've said it to employees that i've worked with to say do you want me to ask you how you're feeling or would you rather just talk about work and like you said bex they might say actually i've talked about cancer all day what i want to hear is what happened with that project or i heard that bobby got promoted tell me all about that so as an hr practitioner you quickly learn what works for that person what's your role um, i certainly would never not ask them about their um health um, for fear of, of not looking supportive, I'd ask them what they want. Um, so yeah, individualised approach is key and no two experiences for an employer or an employee, I'm sure, are ever going to be the same. So asking those questions is really important. I think as well, when a, a patient, uh, an employee, sorry, is having these discussions, it's really important for the employer to, if it's um, okay to do so, is to ask if they want someone there present with them, because often when they're going through treatment, I, whether it be physical pain or you know emotional pain, they're not really gonna retain an awful lot of the information. So to perhaps have a loved one there or a colleague um, there just to write the notes and everything, that can also be really useful as well to have someone else present in the meetings, um, just so that if they do forget things, then obviously you know they can go away and reread the notes and everything. So if that's able to happen i would always recommend to employees to have someone with them yeah absolutely. it's a really good idea um thanks thanks Bex. thanks kate um if, we, if there's a lot of lot been said today lots to take in it's it's a complex area but with the right kind of thinking the right kind of support individuals can um can return to work and continue working in a really productive way 
But I, I guess if we were to sum it up, um, it's, it's really four points. It's, it's to be flexible. Um, we've mentioned that a lot today, to, to find the right kind of approach for the individual. Um, to have that open dialogue, to communicate all the time, but critically talk, of, talk in a way that suits that individual um, rather than ass assuming it's a health question. To Kate's point, it may well be that you, of course, need to consider that, but equally they may have made it need a, an, another approach that, um, that suits their needs. Um, to make the adjustments uh, in the appropriate way, again, personalised and customised uh, and within the, the abilities of the organisation to, to do that. Um, but also, you may have a whole range of, of policies or benefits that just might support the individual. Um, I'm sure from a HR perspective and a wellbeing perspective, they're, they're highlighted and signposted early on. Um, but there, there's often EAP programs and, and benefits that, uh, that sit in the background that could be used really effectively. So um, perhaps an obvious thing to say to the audience on this webinar, but equally, um, make sure that those are used effectively. Um, but there, there's lots, lots been said. We'll send you the, a copy of, of this um, deck that we've just been through now um, for the people registered on, on the webinar. So you'll have this to refer back to. Um, but just to finish off, um, obviously we're talking about cancer here. And if, if anybody here has um, has some thoughts, have triggered some concerns, some worries, um, either in their own person, personally or the wider family environment. If you are concerned, then to reach out to us. We have a team of nurses available to help um, if anybody's um, concerned by what they've heard today. Um, equally, if you have an organisation that feels they're not perhaps over the cancer support approach in the way that they'd like to be, then of course uh, we do this day, out, day in, day out. Colleagues like um, Bex and a whole team of support managers and nurses um, do this brilliantly. Um, so um, if you feel you need support or help on that in an organisational level, then please call a number, give us a, or give us an email and we'll, we'll pick that up. But um, we hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, as I said, the deck and the recording will be sent to you by email. Um, I'd like to thank Kate and, and Bex for, for joining me today. Um, some really important points raised, I think. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, some of the things that have been said, the tips, the guidance, you may be able to take a few back and perhaps use um, in your, your working environment um, uh, and be prepared or help individuals that might be going through a, a cancer journey. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Thank you to, once again to Kate and Bex. And uh, we'll, we've got a series of webinars running through, so there's more to come. So look out for our emails and or check out our website uh, for other topics that are coming through. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.